Something happened. Hmm? Oh, I was just wondering if anything like has gone wrong. <laughs> um, that thing's still doing the damn where it won't let me get on it. Uh, I decided to restart it. Let's see if you, you can walk in there too.
Hello, friends. Can you hear me online? If you can, uh, if you could put a thumbs up, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So, um, so I'm going to uh, start us with our prayers as soon as, um, is Eli, could you put the seven line prayer for our, our guests? Praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, teacher, O oh, destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, bound to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O oh, destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, O oh, destroyer, Thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, the Supreme Faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, 
May I liberate my graders from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in time enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, May the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jewel mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my dams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion, Please send forth waves of your blessings. Vidam Guru Ratnam Mandalakam Nuyati Yami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on Massa Vulture's mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration in the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvar looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvar, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shaivari Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Putra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear having completely passed beyond error, reached the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. 
Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. We'll say it one time and then 20 times to ourselves. Taita gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Taita gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva Mahasasha, trained in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharavari Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Brad. And I'm going to give a talk today about um, reliance on a teacher. And so um, my um, refuge name is uh, Yeshi Rapton. And funny, the last time I gave a talk here, I said that my refuge name was uh, Yeshi Darge. So I kind of got a little bit confused. So confusion is my baseline, just to let you know. <laughs> but it was funny because I was thinking of like Yeshi or uh, Geshe Rapton and Geshe Darge. And I think I just went the wrong route in terms of the old. Um, teachers with by those names. So anyway, to clarify, Yeshi Rapton. And uh, 2019 is when I um, first took refuge with Lama Jempa. I met, so I met Lama Jempa in 1998 when I first came here after I got out of college. And so, um, you know, this topic of how to rely on a teacher is um, something that I've been working with for a long time. And I think that um, it has a lot of different levels to it, you know, and it's very personal. Everybody has different experiences with it. And maybe you could say we all need to work on some different little aspect of it, you know. And so, um, you know, I'd like to, um, I'd like to talk about it in, in kind of three different ways. I'd like to talk about it in terms of the text, the actual Lam Rim Chenma, which is, you know, the text that I um, got the information from. And then I'd also like to talk about it from the aspect of an example, you know, and a lot of times examples are people's biographies, like teachers' biographies, and uh, great beings and their biographies. And then, lastly, I'd like to talk about it uh, from my own experience. And so, um, you know, to start with, um, you know, we have to we have to find a teacher. And for us, um, you know, here at Lions Roar, for a lot of people, they've already found a teacher, but many people haven't found a teacher. And it, um, and even for myself, you know, um, you know, I've made connections with teachers, and maybe things change karmically, and that person is no longer around, and then, and then, you know, um, looking for a new teacher. And so, um, I think the cool thing about this path is there's very clear um, instruction about what what is a teacher, you know. And so, I'd like to start with um, just a quote from the text that talks about um, the qualities of a teacher. And so um, 
Rely on a Mahayana teacher who is disciplined, serene, and thoroughly pacified, has good qualities to passing those of the students, is energetic, has a wealth of scriptural knowledge, possesses loving concern, has thorough knowledge of reality and skill in instructing disciples, and has abandoned dispiritedness. And so um, I think that, um, you know, when we, you know, when we look for a teacher just in our general lives, you know, there's, there's kind of a lower, there's a standard of like, does this person know, you know, this information that I want to learn, you know? And so, but when looking for a Dharma teacher, um, the bar is quite a bit higher, right? Because what we're looking for is somebody that can lead us, you know, along this path that, um, that is maybe like long and tedious, it's long and tedious, and that has a lot of pitfalls and, and ups and downs. And so, um, you know, I think that, that, you know, that quote to begin with, you know, there, I mean, there's a lot to it, you know, the teacher has to have knowledge of the Dharma themselves and has to have practiced. And um, not only practice, but has some realization of those, of those, um, those concepts. So along with, um, along with finding a teacher, once we found a teacher, we have to be able to be a, um, a disciple, you know, and I think in my mind, you know, and this is, I don't know, this, I guess this is, you know, how I think, I think, well, what can I get from this situation? You know, I mean, my natural assumption is like, it's not about me. It's about like, what, what are they going to give me? You know, but really in the, in the text, it also goes through this idea of like, there's, there's characteristics that students have to have, you know? And, and what I like about that is, is it puts responsibility on me, you know, like I have to do something to um, like keep my side of the street clean and, and make sure that I'm relating to the teacher in, in, a, um, in a positive way. And so um, anyway, that's the, um, that's really kind of the essence of the talk today is like as a student, um, you know, how do I rely on a teacher? And so what I'm going to do too is I'm going to read some of the qualities that, um, that students are supposed to possess. All right, so this is a, um, this is a quote um, from uh, Arya Deva in the 400 stanzas that says, it is said that one who is nonpartisan, intelligent, and diligent is a vessel for listening to the teachings. The good qualities of the instructors do not otherwise appear or do not appear otherwise, and nor do those of fellow listeners. And so, um, from the standpoint of being a student, it's, you know, it, it mentions intelligence, nonpartisan, and diligent. And those three things kind of speak to me definitely. Like, the whole idea is that nonpartisan is we're going into this not having all these preconceived notions, like about um, what the teachings are, um, um, you know, do I agree or do I not agree? Um, the other thing that I like about um, this path and being a Dharma practitioner is that we have to be intelligent and we have to discriminate. You know, we're not going to just go into a situation with a teacher and just say, oh, you know, and just believe everything that they say. There's, we're required to have some intelligence to be able to decipher, you know, what are good teachings and what are, are maybe not so good um, advice. And I think that um, the thing that Lama Jimpa does with us a lot of times is he allows us that space. You know, he gives it, he asks us, um, you know, and even with, uh, even with our, um, some of the, you know, coursework that we're doing, it's like, he's asking us to kind of debate with him about it. Is this, you know, is this re really true for you, you know, or is this, you know, something that's not worthwhile? And then the last part of that was the, the diligence part. And that puts, um, that puts it on me, you know, you know, I, um, I receive teachings from a teacher and it's up to me to put them into practice. You know, I, I'm not, it's not, I don't just come to a teaching and just sit and listen and to say, oh, that sounded good. And that was inspirational. And now I'm just going to go home and do everything that I normally do and just, you know, not pay attention to the, the teachings that I receive. And maybe that's the, um, on, a, on a most simple level, that's the, um, the, the thing that I guess I think about is like, I need to follow the advice that was given to me, <laughs> you know, on a real basic level. And it sounds really simple, but it's not, you know, it's number one, I got to remember what the advice is. And then, and then number two, I got to take it out into my life 
and actually um, think about it and, and ruminate on it and, uh, and, and uh, try to practice it. And so um, there's another section here that kind of goes through, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff in here that um, talks about the qualities of a student. And the other thing that I really like here um, is they go, they, they kind of summarize it again, these ideas into like four topics. And the um, first one is striving very diligently at the teachings, focusing the mind well when listening to the teachings, having great respect for the teachings and the instructor, um, discarding bad explanations and retaining good explanations. So um, I think that, uh, you know, the way that I, the way that I was taught how to um, really try to get these into my mind was that, you know, number one, you, um, as an example, you receive teaching on the long rim. Then number two is you go home and you, um, you try to study those teachings and really get those teachings into your mind. And then number three, you do analytical meditation where you sit down and you go over kind of point by point each topic. And then, and then you come to a conclusion and, and you try to keep that conclusion in your mind. Like, okay, I, um, I've kind of gone through the concepts and now it's like, all right, I really need to be able to um, rely on my teacher and, uh, and this is how I'm going to do it. And then you kind of sit and you, you find that space and just hold it. And so um, the other thing too, so they have, they have another, a bunch of other sections that um, go through the attitudes of, uh, of what a student should have. And I really like this and it's really long and I'm not going to go through all the different topics, but I'm going to go through a couple of them that, um, that I find kind of, you know, interesting. And so the first one is, is to approach your teacher with the attitude of a dutiful child. You know, I have, I have, I have teenagers right now, so I have, I don't hardly remember what it was like to have a dutiful child, but your kids are smaller. So you probably remember, it's kind of like everything that you say to them, it's like a wonder, you know, and they want to be around you all the time. And they, and they, um, you tell them about some thing that could hurt them and they're just like, Oh my God, you know, they're, and so it's like having that attitude of like, uh, um, in my mind, I think of it as a young child, but it says a dutiful child. And, and you know what, in a, in a lot of ways, it's really true. Your llama is like giving you advice about, hey, this could harm you, you know, or this is like a danger, dangerous part of, of something, or, or um, this is really gonna help you if you do this, you know? And so, but there are, so there are a bunch of attitudes, there are a bunch of attitudes that are supposed to be developed. And then the other one is uh, like a diamond, um, like the earth, and then um, how to assume responsibilities. And so each one of these goes through kind of an analogy of, of, uh, um, of the way that you should rely on your teacher. And so the diamond one is, uh, it says this, this means to make the relationship with you and your teacher as close as possible and as stable as possible without letting anything split it apart. Um, so, all right, so that, um, I'm gonna move on to the, um, Kind of my next um, section and so now i'm going to talk about um, example and so uh you know i think that like the biographies are amazing when you read the biographies of milarepa and his relationship with marpa and the great um lengths that practitioners went to um to to follow their teachers and to um and to have um and to gain realizations as a result of following those teachers sometimes to me it's really hard to relate to that stuff it's like wow so i'm supposed to like just give everything up and spend my whole life you know you know with um you know on that level you know and i think that i think that that's there's a the point that i kind of came to with you know thinking about this talk and giving these teachings is that we're all at these different levels you know and we all have these different karmic tendencies towards our teachers and it's kind of like we have to um we have to be kind of honest with where we are right now you know and not um not think like well i could just um i could just abandon everything and i could just you know immediately follow um you know just kind of pretend like i'm on a different level and so um when i was uh when i was you know in college i, I went to school in seattle and i um and i had um I'd met a teacher, his name was Lo Seng Chopo, and he was a, um, a monk from uh, Ganden, and he was, 
he was kind of of that era of Trijang Rinpoche where he had spent time with him and he was a, a disciple. And, and for the group of us at the time, we thought, wow, this is really amazing. This is somebody who's just really amazing. And he, um, he gave empowerments to a small group of us in, in our apartments. And we had this really close kind of connection. And I had this, I had this friend, David Gonzalez, and he was a pretty serious practitioner. And, uh, and I watched what he, the way that he acted with Los Sanchopal, you know, and I, and I got to watch it over a long period of time. And for me, this was a really great example of what a disciple was like. Los Sanchopal, you know, only spoke Tibetan and he told David, he said, you know what? He said, if you learn Tibetan, I'll come back next year and I'll give teachings. And so David Gonzalez, like a maniac, started studying and found a teacher to, to give him teachings on how to speak Tibetan. And so Gelong Chopal came back the next year and he was, you know, he was able to kind of like get through some teachings along with reading the outlines and, but within a couple of years, he was able to um, actually um, like speak and translate and translate books and things like that. And so the next thing that Gelong Chopal said to him was that we, uh, you know, my monastery was destroyed, you know, in Tibet and I want to rebuild it. And so David Gonzalez went out and started like raising money and he, and he was somebody who um, he didn't even have a job. He was like one of those Dharma practitioners that just practiced all the time. You know, and I watched, I was like, there's no way he's going to be able to do this, <laughs> you know. And so he raised enough money to completely rebuild the monastery through people that he knew in Seattle and, he, and, and in these weird karmic ways found people that made donations and and it really it really inspired me because he had faith you know he had just this faith that like you know what i'm just going to try you know and then um and then uh you know he there were a bunch of other things that he asked them to do that that were equally as difficult and you know each time you know he would he would just had had faith that he would just try you know and so um you know as a result i um I looked at that and I was like, man, there's no way that I could do that. But what I did was I did, I, I started to form the relationship on my own, on my own kind of level, you know, and following, um, trying to follow um, Gelong Chopal from, from my own perspective. And what I realized right away was, is that a skillful teacher won't ask a disciple something that they're way beyond. You know, they're, they're very in tune with who you are and what you're all about. And, uh, and Gelong Chopa wasn't going to ask me, hey, go out and raise money for my monastery, because I would have just been like, there's no way I could do that. And I would have just like, I would have probably ran, you know, is what I probably would have done. And so, um, you know, so, so, the, so the teacher-disciple relationship is a dual thing, you know, it's like, all right, I have a certain level on my side, and, and they have a certain level on their side, you know, and there's, a, and there's an interaction that goes on that's, a, that's kind of a special thing. So to make, you know, to make a long story short, you know, I, um, I moved here to Sacramento for my job and, and I met my wife and I started, you know, to have, you know, a family and, and, uh, and it was very, it was very, um, you know, I would try to go up to Seattle when there were teachings and, and, uh, and David Gonzalez eventually died of uh, liver cancer, you know, and, and that was an amazing thing watching him do all the stuff that he was doing and he never wavered on his practice he never wavered on his translation stuff that he was doing and uh you know and he um he kept his like bonds or samaya strong with gelong chopal and, and it was really an amazing thing to watch you know i don't um i think that in itself was a teaching you know to to be able to see that and to see how they interacted and and uh and so um Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I ended up here in, in Sacramento, you know, a little bit isolated, you know, I had received all these teachings and I thought in my mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just practice, you know, I received all the teachings and now I can just practice. And it, it went well for a while, but after, um, after David Gonzalez died and I kind of lost touch with Gelong Chopal and it was harder to communicate because I, I don't speak Tibetan, I came up with this feeling of like, you know what, I need to find a teacher, you know. And I made prayers is what I did. I made strong prayers. I said, you know what? I am, um, you know, I'm struggling on my own and, and, uh, and I, um, 
you know, I like to think of it, it was almost like I was an unsupervised Dharma practitioner. <laughs> you know, and I was, uh, <laughs> and so I, you know, I made lots of prayers and I did some purification practice because that's what I had learned, you know, that's, that's what you do, you know. And so I had, uh, I've been, um, you know, I've, I've been to some teachings that um, Lama Jimpa had done. He'd also brought together, brought some amazing teachers here. I went to the Chodan Rinpoche teachings when those were here, and then um, Jada Rinpoche in 2015. And, uh, and it wasn't until I saw the center that, that he started here where I thought, wow, there's something like special going on here. You know, who is this? Who is this guy, you know, and what, you know, what is he, you know, he's, you know, he's a Western Lama and, and what kind of, what is he doing here that's, that's special, you know, in my mind. And, uh, and I just started, I, I started to become open to the idea of, of, um, you know, taking him on as a teacher or becoming a student of his. And um, it was very, it was, the timing of it was, was amazing, you know, and I still don't kind of understand it. I made this appointment with him like a couple of weeks before my wife had this really serious medical problem. And, uh, and, I, and a bunch of like, after that, a bunch of things on the outside of my life kind of started to unravel, you know, and, it, and I had that first meeting with him and it was really kind of like the, the beginning of our, our relationship. And the timing was perfect, you know, because I, um, you know, I had a, I had a lot of stuff that that started and that still kind of continues to go on, and I and all of a sudden I had the support of a teacher, you know, that to give me guidance. And so, um, you know, I I, I realized with uh, um, with a teacher, a teacher has a vision usually, you know, and and the and all I had to do was look around here to see what Lama's vision was. You know, and the cool thing about um, being part of a center is, is that you get to help your teacher bring that vision into um, reality. And it's kind of amazing when you think about it. This center that we're all sitting in was somebody's idea one time, at once, at one point. All it was was an idea. You know, it, wasn't, it didn't exist in any kind of outward way. But as a result of a lot of people here working really hard, and, and I'm sure a lot of prayers, and a lot of energy, you know, from, from Lama and his vision, you know? And so I, I decided that I wanted to be part of that vision. You know, I wanted to do some, I wanted, and, and I think like studying the Lama Rim, it's like, I have to, if I'm gonna progress on this path, I have to do something to benefit people. You know, I have to really do something to benefit people. And, you know, I, I work as a nurse and I, I feel like I benefit people sometimes. And sometimes I don't know if I'm benefiting or, or I'm harming them. You know, sometimes in reality, like, is this really helping people? But I think when it comes to Dharma, it's like, you know, the way that we can really um, benefit people is by, um, by having a center and, and helping people deal with like their untamed minds. You know, and, and I know in my, with my own situation, especially in these last few years, I've had some crazy, crazy stuff going on. And there have been times where I felt okay. You know, in the midst of it, I just felt like, you know, I'm all right, I'm gonna be all right, you know? And that's a direct result of Dharma. It's not a result of uh, just sitting around doing breathing meditation and concentrating on my breath. You know, it's from, you know, trying to absorb this information and, and trying to take the advice of a teacher and, uh, and trying to um, actually put it into practice. So um, the other book that um, I've just recently been working with is this, I, this book called The Guru Principle. And so when we, um, when we started talking about, um, let's see if you can see that. When, we started, when I started discussing this um, topic with Lama, he had, uh, he, as always, he kind of gives you a whole bunch of different information that kind of turns what, what I was thinking about kind of on its head. And, uh, and the guru principle, I mean, I've, I've just started reading it, so I can't really um, intelligently comment on it <laughs> very thoroughly, but, but it talks about this idea of, this, of Samaya. And I always thought of Samaya was like you receive kind of teachings or empowerments from a teacher and you, um, and you try to keep that bond really strong. And the way that you keep it strong is like by doing the practice, by um, having a um, good relationship with your teacher, by not criticizing and by um, seeing their strengths and not their faults. 
but I th but I think it's I think it's a lot more than that. I think it is, uh, you know, as I said before, like like taking their advice. The other thing too is is being open with your teacher, you know, and not only being open, but Lama talks about this a lot, being transparent, you know. And so, what is what does transparency mean? You know, I think it means not not trying to hide your faults or, or your hurts or the things that um, you, you're trying to protect yourself with and uh, and just kind of laying it all out there. And I, I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty guarded person in a lot of ways, you know, I, uh, you know, I, but for some reason with Lama, it's, it's really easy. He's a trustworthy person. And I think that that's the other quality that a teacher has is that they, they're trustworthy. And I um, and trustworthiness. Um, it's it's kind of like you it's something that you develop it doesn't just happen you know you for me it's like i i kind of watched him for a long time like well who is this guy and what is he all about you know and then i realized oh he's very stable with what he's doing and then i started to talk to him and i and and with discussion and and it's like all right well he um he's giving me good advice you know, I'm using that discrimination that, that I learned as part of the Dharma. He's giving me good advice, you know. And then, um, and then also he keeps the information between us. That to me is important, you know, is, is, uh, is this person, you know, honest and reliable. So, so back to, um, you know, how do we rely on a teacher? Um, I think we all have, we all have different abilities and karma stuff that's going on and i think that um if i if i look around at you i could say oh wow you know i'm my reliance isn't really as strong as yours or we can compare each other and and uh i think what i have to do is i have to look at where i've been and where i where i've come from and where i where i am now you know and so where i am now it's like it's very um you know just having a having a teacher who i can talk to and, and rely on and who can give me advice and and uh is a, is a really special thing. So anyway, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably ending here a little bit early, but this is, a, um, I think it'd be great to hear from everybody else because I'm sure we all have like experience in, you know, pitfalls and ups and downs. And, and so it would be, uh, it'd be great to hear from other people and maybe uh, questions at this point. I don't know. Did I do it? Did I? Is it on? Yes. Thank you so much for for your great your talk. Um, I really I really appreciate it so much. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, it's just kind of a little story from not so long ago. But he, I was with him and I, I told him, you know, because um, I'm getting older and I said, you know, my next life, I hope I don't get so lost like mm -hmm. I did in this life. I told him that because um, I just had a, a lot of obstacles, like a lot of people. And then he told me, um, he said, no, you never were lost. Those obstacles help you understand people. And you needed those experiences so you can understand people. So I just wanted to share that one recent story because it was mm -hmm. so helpful because I sometimes was like, gosh, I wonder what I did in my previous life that I had all, all these obstacles. And he turned it on its head, you know, those, sometimes he calls them, well, that, does, that doesn't matter, but that's the main thing. I just wanted to share that. All right, thanks, Heidi. All right, anybody um, from the Zoom land? <laughs> or anybody in-house either, too? Before. You mentioned that um, you met a teacher in Seattle and that he spoke Tibetan. I was curious, how did you, how did you know, how did you get anything from that in the first place? You, you know, like, how did you recognize the qualities mm. and receive the teachings in such a way that you recognize that teacher as a great teacher? You know what, I think I, the part of it was I'd already had like Dharma teachings. I'd already been a student for a while. And then um, typically there's a translator, you know, that, um, that um, will translate the teachings. 
And then my, my, as I'd mentioned, my friend David Gonzalez had, you know, learned to be, to speak Tibetan and be a translator. And, you know, it was, I had a, another interesting experience that I'd never had gotten to share during this talk, but I went with Gelong Chopal to Dharamsala at one point in 2000. And uh, the idea was I was going to escort him back to his family's house in Dharamsala. And it was, uh, it was like, that was a teaching in itself because I did, he and I did, weren't able to communicate. You know, we were on this long flight, you know, we landed in, in New Delhi and, and, uh, and it was, uh, just like, just like you're kind of alluding to it's, it was very challenging to um, communicate with each other. But I think the thing is, is with a teacher, there's a lot of stuff that, that gets, um, communicated that it's beyond verbal, you know, seeing the way that he reacted and acted towards people, you know, seeing the way that he related to his family once we got to Dharamsala, you know, him kind of encouraging me to, um, to go to teachings and, you know, through translators. And so I think that there, um, I, the, maybe you're, I don't know if you're, the, maybe the point that you made is really valid. You know, it's like we, um, it's, it's very difficult, really. You know, and I think that we have the benefit here of uh, of having a teacher who's practiced and studied for a long time and who has, you know, a lot of skill that can that can teach us, you know, and also the cultural stuff was crazy, you know, and uh, and I, I didn't really understand a lot of it, but it was, uh, you know, there was a lot of um, formality and, and things that went on and I'm sure that I broke a lot of, you know, a lot of those rules, but um, yeah, there's a lot of cultural stuff that that um that i didn't have the benefit of understanding and and i think even from our standpoint we we benefit from being part of the same culture as, as lama jimpa you know he can see that hey wow here's you know here's the tough part of our culture that we have to overcome and and uh and and he i think he's pretty skillful at being able to point in that direction to help us to deal with things that maybe a tibetan teacher might not be able to do so So uh, there's a hand raised by Karen Burrow online. So. Is that right? All right, go ahead, Karen. I think there's a few people before me. Right. So if they want to go, I'll wait. No, okay. Um, I just wanted, you said something there at the end about, um, about the student, the other students of the Lama. And I think that I keep kind of rediscovering that over and over and over again, how important it is because he's teaching each of the students that he has in their way. And what I find is that when I talk to these other students and we have this tendency to compare and oh, they're ahead of me or they're behind me or they're this way or whatever, we make these judgments. But actually, if I would take the time to listen to some of their what they're learning, that it all it also reaches me. So really kind of we have this huge resource. It's not just, I mean, yes, we have the relationship with the Lama, but you got to understand he's got the relationship with each of the other students and and then we can learn from within that whole, he used one time called it organism, <laughs> one whole mm -hmm. learn to get from each other that way. So I just want to kind of validate what you brought up there. All right, thanks, Karen. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Bradley. That yeah. was a great talk. Um, it really uh, got me thinking about some subjects that I've been, I guess, curious about and um, contemplating. So I appreciate, like, it's really obvious that you prepared and you've been studying and practice. So thank you very much for your efforts. Right. Um, I've been uh, watching some talks by a man who's a long-term uh, therapist and he specializes in addiction recovery. Mm -hmm. And um, he also is very interested in applying uh, ideas of complex trauma to addiction therapy. And he looks at uh, Gabor Mate's work in, in the realm of Hungry Ghost. Mm -hmm. It's the book that that man came out with. So I find that to be darm, you know, that's obviously dharmic related. Mm -hmm. Um, but what he was saying is a lot of time when people come into recovery, generally, you know, they've had extreme suffering. And so that's why they're looking to get sober and to come into a healing way. 
And uh, he said primarily in his experience over the years, uh, women are ready, like they've, they've been uh, bad. They've, they've uh, been destructive and they're ready to be good girls. Uh, the men seem to have a harder time wanting to be good boys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I find that interesting. I have my own little ideas about that, that maybe there's some like ideas of masculinity in our culture that, that make it difficult for us to see that like we can be men and still have goodness and have purity and have mm. joy and be tender in our lives. Um, but that that's really a very positive thing. And what got me thinking about that was what you were talking about with a dutiful child. Mm. You know, I think in my relationship uh, with Lama, like there's been this real understanding that, uh, that these concepts uh, around what I'm thinking of as a dutiful child are actually uh, very enriching for me and very freeing, and that it's a, a wonderful experience, um, you know, both for me individually and for others. And I think it's really related to um, the idea of Samaya, like what you were talking about, uh, really got me thinking, is that something I'm very curious about, like what is this Samaya? and um, you know, I guess I've been thinking of it in terms of um, like a rule, rule based kind of thing. Mm. And I, I think when you were speaking about it, what clicked in me was a, an intimacy and a, a coming together in, a, in the division, in the mind stream. Mm. I think the only time I've seen people have um, this maybe is like uh, reaching, but. Um, feel a little, little out of place saying this, but I'll go for it. Um, when I've seen issues, it's because someone really wants to impose an unhealthy mind stream and isn't willing to open up to a healthy dharmic way of being. Um, and I, I think the, the more that we can uh, accept or the more I can accept that like I want goodness that I want purity and that this is actually a beneficial thing for me that um, uh, those those mind streams uh, with myself and others not honestly not just the teacher uh, become uh, more intimate mm. So thank you for all that. I'm sorry, that was a lot of spill. I, I did have a question too about um, with your qualities of the teacher, what, um, what you think uh, has overcome dispirited, dispiritedness means? Yeah, you know what? I, I think of dispiritedness is like, all right, like saying bad things about people. <laughs> I mean, that's in my mind, or even, or even being negative, you know, like the dispiritedness to me means like a teacher who's um, criticizing others, who's being very negative. And uh, in my, um, my example with Lama Jempa, it's really hard to find it. He doesn't say very many negative things to me, you know, and in the, in the things that Maybe he's, I guess there's a, there's a point of being, not being critical, but, but pointing out things that I need to work on, you know, but I think dispiritedness to me means um, generally being negative and, and, uh, and, and causing, you know, problems for other people, you know, a llama who would call, you know, which is hard to imagine, right? But there is a, we do have examples of that, unfortunately. Uh, anybody from uh, Zoom land that has a question? Yeah. Hey, Bradley, thank you so much for your talk. Um, a couple of things have come up in our chat. Um, one, Ellen says, thank you. I'm at Lotus View today and won't be able to speak live, but she said she really appreciated what you had to say about a teacher not asking you more than what you're able to do. That it, it, she says it gives her confidence not to hide from her teacher. Mm, thanks. And um, there was another question that was, um, how do you deal with a disappoint with disappointing a teacher? 
Yeah, that's, um, I think that, uh, I think that I, I, I guess I realize that I have limitations, you know, and I, um, I guess one example of this would be, you know, you in a real formal way, you know, you, you receive an empowerment and, uh, and part of the empowerment is the commitment to do the practice and the commitment to, to follow through on it. And, uh, and I, I've definitely, um, you know, had, had breaks in practice, maybe for whatever reason, haven't, you know, kept those commitments. And I think that, um, I think I just, I kind of, there's some humility there of realizing that, you know what, I have limitations, you know, and I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying as hard as I can. And maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I need to try harder or maybe I need to refocus my energy. But I, I think that that's one of the ways that, um, that I've dealt with it. And then also, I think the nice thing about a lot of these practices, there are ways to kind of clean up our, our, our vows that we've made, you know, when we've broken our, our commitments. And, the, and some of it is very, um, you know, it's, a, uh, it's very ceremonial, but I think inside, but down inside, it's like these are, this is the way to kind of like clean up and purify some of the vows that you've broken or the, or the um, disappointments maybe. So that's, that's how I deal with it. Uh, Bradley. Yeah, go ahead. This, this is Elizabeth. You know, I find having a teacher very difficult. I'm uh, very argumentative. And um, I don't like a lot of people. And when I first, I, when I first met Lama Jimpa, I thought, eh. And then um, I had a very strong dream about him that went on for a long time. And it was, I was awake in the dream and it, the dream was like having a month off from any kind of worry, which I found uh, sort of really upended things for me. I had had a teacher before for 20 years who never, well, when she would appear, she was like having a month long vacation, but, um, I didn't have access to her all the time, and she had limitations. And um, after I developed a relationship with Lama Jimpa, then he asked me to stop doing something I really didn't want to stop doing. And um, I just said, no, I'm not doing that. And then we argued. And he and I argue an, an awful lot. And um, during 2020, he hung up on me several times when we were FaceTiming because he didn't want me to argue. So there's, you know, there's a basic, uh, you know, I recently had an argument with him about Dharma Kurti, uh, the guy who translated the book. And um, he's very skillful in uh, dealing with my personality, which can be tragically awful um, because I was trained to argue lots of things. So, you know, the, the teacher, your relationship can be fraught with um, great difficulty. You do find out a few things, but I have a tendency just to say, no, I'm not doing that. Forget it. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there are those aspects to your personality. <laughs> At least Loma doesn't uh, come back forcefully and say, you're an idiot, um, at least not all the time. You know, I think, uh, I think the nice thing about what you're talking about is you got that transparency part down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the thing is, I'm maybe, I think the thing is we gotta be real with each other too. You know, and that's what I like about what you're saying is, but at the same time, we also have to, we have to maintain kind of a, a positive feeling towards each other too, regardless of, of what arguments we have and what disagreements that we have. And so, um, you know, thanks for being real and thanks for sharing. <laughs> I do feel very positive about Lama Jimpa. Don't <clears throat> mistake what I'm saying. He's yeah. actually 
um, it's a privilege to be uh, able to learn from him. I've learned a tremendous amount from him. Yeah, thanks. thanks a lot, that was a great talk. Um, just before I came over here, I was just thinking about like, you know, my relation isn't really necessarily to Tibetan uh, Buddhism as much as it is to having a Lama, having a teacher, having someone that, you know, you can be a solo practitioner forever, but you need someone, I think, to there with a sword, a smile on their face and a sword behind their back to, to keep you in line sometimes. And you, you know, there's so much stuff going on the ego. Um, you always need that person. And I, two things, I mean, that popped out in your, in your, 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 your discussion, but the other thing, two things that popped out were, um, the dutiful child, and also how it relates to the, the cultural issues. Buddhism is an imported, you know, way of thinking. I find that all the different Buddhism permutations in the U.S. and Europe, they come with varying degrees of cultural baggage. And um, what I really like about Lama Jimpa is he kind of cuts through that. I mean, I heard on his online talk a few weeks ago, he's talking about um, how really cutting through all the, the baggage of different cultures, there's the Four Noble Truths, you know, and it's dealing with suffering. And I thought, wow, this is the guy for me. I mean, he can see past all the, you know, the bells and whistles of the cultural stuff sometimes and say, what's the, what's the heart of the matter? And, uh, and when it comes to the dutiful child, I think that relates because <clears throat> it's hard sometimes. You kind of have to read the room when you're walking into each Buddhist teacher or each, each it could go any religion, really. It's not just Buddhism, but Kind of where are they? And I, I, I just thought, sorry to get on here, but um, I was just thinking about because I saw once um, someone had the story about like Western students that had a great relationship, really sweet llama was always really sweet to them, and then they saw that same llama with Tibetan students, mm -hmm. and he was super harsh with them, you know. <laughs> and they're like, "Well, why don't we get that?" And like, "Because you're Western students." And I had that, I've had that experience many times where I didn't really read the room and. Um, I remember once I was in a, a big hall and I asked the, the Lama or Rinpoche, I said, you know, I'm having trouble falling asleep all the time. Can you give me some advice? And he said something that, that felt like he didn't really understand. To me, it seemed like he didn't understand the question or something. And I was like, well, well, actually, I mean, like, really falling asleep, literally. And I got these two people, like, the, I think they knew that he was a real cultural, like, traditionalist. And they're like, don't talk back, you know. <laughs> back in your box, shut up. It's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and I'm really jabbering on, but I was just wondering if you, if any of those points, if you want to talk, because you had the experience with a cultural traditionalist and then you found Lama Jimpa and, um, and you're a dutiful child, but you've also mentioned how, you know, some point you have limits and, um, but it's the teacher that really at the heart of it. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's funny because I mentioned my friend David Gonzalez and, and Galen Chopa would be like that with him. He was very like hardcore and just like, and with me, he was like, oh, just like, it was like I was a little child. He was kind of spoon feeding, you know, and just in aware, in aware that I could, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, freak out or whatever. But, but I think that, um, I think that's the, part of that is the, the skill of the teacher too, right? And, and, you know, no, and we all have a different experience of, of our teacher, right? And I think that, um, I think, you know, the, um, the part of that, yeah, it's just the skill of the teacher, so. All right, all right. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, for example, I mean, when our parents uh, are different, they don't need other things to have some type of information or something that they can do for you, so you may not necessarily be uh, able to do it. So I think it's important to look at the preference of the parents in order to give you the information that you have. Um, Uh, 
That's a good point. And I think that, um, you know, we're not part of just some tradition where we just go along with everything. I mean, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about a, a teacher student relationship. And, uh, you know, I had, I had before I had met Galen Chopal as part of a, a group called the NKT, you know, and it was, uh, um, there was a lot of really bizarre stuff that was going on, you know, and I was a new Dharma practitioner. I didn't even really know, you know, and uh, at some point, you know, you have to, um, you have to compare your teachers in the, in the organization or the students behavior to what the teachings are. And if things don't align, then at that point, you have to make a decision, you know, and, it, and it's uh, um, when you, when you take all these commitments and you, and there's all this intensity around the student teacher relationship, it's pretty hard to walk away from that, you know, but I think that, um, I think we have a guide that tells us what, what, um, what are our, um, our kind of baseline behaviors, you know, and, and how we should be acting, you know, and, and the teachers should be held up to those standards just as, as much as the student. So, thanks. I can, but I'm not sure if anybody else can. Okay, green. That's what I was looking for. So thanks for the talk. It's really interesting to hear everyone else's experiences because, you know, Lama Jimpa is a skillful person and he's able to relate to us all in a different way. And it's really interesting to hear other people's experiences. But um you know personally when i think about contributing to this discussion it's so vast to think about the relationship that i have with him and how it's affected my life that i almost wasn't even going to say anything mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's just too much so just speaking uh, spontaneously just um you know the difference between my life before and my life now is huge um because of the, what I've learned and the mental shifts that have occurred along the way, um, you know, number one was to stop attacking myself because that was the main thing that I've been doing my entire life. To lay down those arms has allowed me to like grow in ways that I never thought were possible. And I met him after 14 years of, of regular psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the psychotherapy kept me on this planet, but it did not uh, relieve the suffering. And um, these teachings just clicked like clockwork. It just was amazing. And the way I ended up being here was just so like being led at the right time mm. um, by some strange circumstances. <laughs> You know, so it's it's pretty incredible um, how, you know, there's the teachings and then there's how he demonstrates himself over time mm. and how things kind of unfold like a flower blooming one petal at a time. You've got to trust that there's a larger vision and it's certainly um, been the case in my life. So extremely grateful for that. But it, it was neat too, going back to his question, is that when I first uh, took refuge, it was right around the time when um, there was the sexual misconduct in the Shambhala community. And, uh, you know, I talked to him about that and there was always fear in my mind, you know, not necessarily of that, but like teachers abusing their power or if you give, your, give yourself so much to a teacher that they could abuse that, you know, I had a lot of fear. Um, but he encouraged the inquiry. He encouraged the looking at it. He, he didn't say, well, you should just believe me. It's, he wanted me to use my mind and, and be discerning and check him out and, you know, watch him reveal himself over time as he has. So that was one thing that was really great is that he just wasn't asking for blind trust. It was um, an earned thing. So anyways, I could go on forever, but just thought I would contribute.
Great, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Bradley. That was um, a really beautiful and heartfelt talk, like you always do. Um, kind of speaking of autumn's transition, I was really touched by uh, your discussion of Samaya and the importance of Samaya itself. And uh, personally, for me, um, I've noticed that the bonds with my teachers have gotten stronger. You know, not just like when we're sitting in Darshan, it's actually more of the time that I'm learning what they taught me in Darshan in real life. So it's interesting because, like, you know, I'll have a darshan, he's giving me a teaching, and I'm cheerful because I'm like spending time with him, like, cool, yeah. And he's like, he'll tell me like this advice or like this, this teaching. And five, six months later, there's an instance, and I have to apply that teaching in my, in my real life. Mm. And I realize, oh shit, he's right, <laughs> you know, like, he, like, this is real, like, this is real, this is applicable, this, this has changed me. And this has changed how I would respond normally. And um, it's like this temporal element kind of dissipates, right? So it's like his bond gets stronger with me because he sees my issue, something that's going to come up in the future for me. He gives me that teaching, time passes, and I actually apply it, and then I become stronger with him. So I'm wondering, what's your experience with um, your bond with your teacher, either Lama or a different one, when they've gotten stronger, do you share that? Yeah, you, you know, you wonder if it's something that they see inside of you. Yeah. Obviously, that's what it is, right? They're giving you a teaching and, and it maybe takes a while to kind of come to fruition. Um, I think sometimes, like on a, on a kind of like a deep level, it's like my mind takes stuff and kind of works with it for a while. Like it doesn't just, click in it maybe it goes from intellectual to being like kind of in your heart and so maybe that's what that is too a little bit like it takes a while to get to to this place of like realizing that it's true and that it's re it's you know like a reality so i don't know i think with a lot of this stuff it um it kind of has its own time you know for for it to kind of take hold yeah thanks all right well Anybody else from the Zoom land? Anybody else have any other questions? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Right. Am I am I on? Yes, I think so. I, I just um wanted to say that uh you know uh, Lama Jimpa is has a, a really big sense of humor. And um, it can not feel so good at the moment sometimes, but at the same time, you don't forget, like, mm -hmm. um, it's just a really simple anecdotal story, but I have a sense, <laughs> like, how I, I don't feel worthy, you know, and I think that's a really common feeling. And I said, oh, I just feel kind of, uh, as well, I feel kind of boring, like I don't have any uh, really smart questions. Sometimes that's how mm -hmm. I feel. Yeah. And uh, this is going to be a long hour because I don't have smart questions. And so... And so that came up for me, and he, and he said, oh, that, well, that's your luxury, I guess. And so I, I thought, well, what's that mean? That's my luxury. And then the next darshan, he brought two phone books, mm. and we read the phone book oh, together. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just tell, this is, he's really creative. Yes. And another time he says, I don't eat right. And so we go to lunch, and I thought, this is amazing. I'm going to lunch. And he didn't get anything. He watched me eat a sandwich, and that's really awkward, you oh, know. Oh wow! You know, and so I, I just mentioned those two stories to to talk about his creativity, uh, and uh, <laughs> I have so many. And then, <laughs> and when I talk to people, then they have their story too. Like, oh wow, yeah, I remember one time he did blah blah. Like, this is really amazing. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. Thanks. You know, in uh, in closing, you know, I um, I wanted to talk a little bit, just say something about this process of like coming up here and giving talks, I was very resistant. And in some ways, like, I think that that prevented me from even wanting to, you know, make an appointment with Lama and, and increase the relationship. And I think at the beginning of it, it was kind of like, you know, oh, you know, I want to go to talks that are given by teachers, you know, and then I started coming to some of the talks that people were given. And I was, I got a lot of really good stuff from the different students that were given talks. And, uh, 
and I, and I learned a lot. And then I realized that like, I was just afraid, you know, I was really par afraid of having to get up and like give a talk and expose myself and, or, and maybe, uh, maybe expose what I didn't know too. That was the other thing. And so I got to say that this has been very transformative for me because it's kind of like, I have to be, I kind of have to like really go, you know what? just be willing to like look a little bit foolish and be willing to um be open in front of people and and just take some risk you know and so for me it's been very beneficial and i've also i've learned a lot from everybody who's given talks too so thanks yeah, dedication all right sounds good hello okay Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin, Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So we have a few announcements too. So uh, one of the announcements is um, Kenshin Rinpoche, who um, some of you know, some of you maybe don't know, but He's going to come February 20th and give a teaching on um, six session guru yoga as a Sunday. So that's really exciting for us. And, um, and then the other announcement is on Friday, there's going to be a, a couple of poets, a musician, some of you might know named Clement, and also um, a painter, the one, the mural painter that painted our Kalachakra mural outside our building. He's known around Sacramento as Johnny. And they're going to come together, and um, and there's going to be art here, all three uh, um, modalities. And so uh, people are welcome to come if they're vaccinated and are willing to wear a mask the whole time. And that'll be on Friday from six to eight. So that's kind of a rush in a way because that's not much publicity time. So if you're able to come, um, that would be wonderful. And uh, then the last thing is that um, for donations. Uh, you know, if you're online, um, there's uh, maybe a, uh, we don't have a donor box, but we have a, a Venmo, I think. Is that right, Autumn? We have Venmo. So, you know, just a few dollars makes such a difference if each of us does that. So that's all. I just wanted to share those few things. Oh, oh one, one more thing. Oh. <laughs> the uh, Venmo ID is at Lion's Gift. L I O N S G I F T. Oh, one one more uh, announcement from Susan. No, it's not an announcement, just a clarification. Okay. So, 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 so Oh, that's right. January 28th. Oh, I made a mistake. My mistake. Thank you so much, Susan. So it's January 28th. Oh, I'm so grateful that I made a mistake because that's too soon. <laughs> so so January 28th. Thank you, Susan. So that'll give us more time to um, let people know and, and prepare. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much, Bradley. All right. Thanks, everyone.